Hi everyone, what's up? Chelsea fans, I hope you're all feeling good. This is Xavier Mbuyamba, and you're listening to the Blue Day Podcast. Enjoy. Hello Chelsea supporters, welcome back my friends to the podcast that will never end. Yes, this is the Blue Day podcast and for Chelsea fans everywhere, every day is a blue day. I am your host, the creator, the man with a face for podcasting, Keith Lawrence, and joining me again this season is a man who wore the blue shirt with pride, it's Steve Wick. Steve, welcome back for this season, how are we? We're all right, Keith, thank you, yeah, all right, a little bit disappointed that we didn't win the Euros, but uh, yeah, but uh, no, looking forward to the new season. Football wasn't coming home this summer. Well, I don't think we played our best team piece throughout the whole mm. tournament. I think it was, uh, you know, I think we were far too conservative. We've been saying for the last six months, we've got the best front six you could ever wish for. And they never played together. And uh, I found it quite sad, actually, that, uh, you know, Grealish, you know, two players that met hardly played were sold for 173 million pounds between them you know and you know to Man United and Man City but the thing that surprised me in the whole of the tournament was the tide had turned and Italy were gaining control and he puts on a 19 year old kid as his first substitution when you've got Grealish sat on the bench and Grealish could win a few free kicks take the pressure off play the clock down if you want him get a few players booked and cause problems in their half. And I found that absolutely amazing. But uh, there we go. There we go. Let's just be thankful that the season's back, though. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's just be... And we're, st- we're celebrating the season as European champions. So it's absolutely. not all bad. And that in itself was a miracle. No <laughs> other club will ever win the European Champions League with their leading goal scorer of eight goals. No one will ever do that again. And it was uh, it was an incredible victory. And yeah. a thoroughly deserved one as well. So Absolutely. Yeah, I thought you know, again we sort of did talk about it on our last show together, but we sort of talked about how Chelsea did deserve it and Man City just didn't turn up and I think there was even certain players that thought it was theirs to win anyway, because they were the overriding favourites. But that was last season. We want to talk about sort of this season. We are going to talk about the upcoming games in the UEFA Super Cup, which we don't seem to win often every time we're in it. And we've got uh, Crystal Palace as our first home game this season. But just wanted to sort of discuss, to to begin with, um, as it is transfer season, a lot of rumours going around about Chelsea, albeit as European champions, a lot of money has been negotiated, for example. A lot of fees have been mentioned. Romelu Lukaku, Steve. Now, love the the last episode we did together, we picked three or maybe even five players that we thought we could want Chelsea to sign or we would hope in Chelsea to sign. Lukaku weren't on that list, but it seems as if he could be heading to Stamford Bridge for around ninety eight million pounds. Steve, what's your take on obviously you know you being a player that left Chelsea but then came back? Um. What's your sort of view on Lukaku? Well, I think the main thing is we've got to find someone and sign someone that's going to score 20, 25 goals a season. And they're few and far between. You've got Kane, you've got Haaland. I like Haaland. But it's became blatantly obvious that he's not going to move this season. Um, Kane would... They would never allow him to sign for Chelsea at uh, from Tottenham. So Lukaku... He's up there as one of Europe's leading goal scorers. He's improved an awful lot since he was at Chelsea. Uh, an awful lot. Um, and as I said, it, it's the main main priority is to get that goal scoring 
centre forward is going to be the focal point, and he's big and powerful. Hmm. And it, uh, you know, I think he get twenty odd goals, twenty five goals this season. As you say, I think striker definitely is what we need. Uh, I don't think there's any other sort of position that we do need to really strengthen on, and it is important that. Steve, obviously, you've seen it when the teams won a trophy that they go out and buy the best, not just because they can, but because a squad needs freshening, more statement of intent signing as well, and it's to keep people on their toes. And I think this Lukaku deal, you know, I know I know a lot of Chelsea fans are not happy with the deal because they don't rate Lukaku, and that's that's up to them. Me personally, I've always liked Lukaku. I was disappointed when we sold him. Was happy that he was going out on loan and progressing, but I was disappointed that he that he left for Everton. I was more disappointed that we didn't re-sign him back in 2017 when we had the chance to do that, and then we kept haggling over a fee with Everton. It's quite ironic, really, that we've haggled over a fee with Everton. Then Man United just came in, said, "Right, we'll pay you what you want." We end up signing Morata. That didn't turn out to be the best signing. For us, and then we go back, and now we're signing Lukaku for an extra thirty million on what we could have signed him back in twenty seventeen. So, where yeah. people people are saying that Chelsea do good business, other times there you get moments whereby it's very very questionable. Put, put it that way. But in regards to Lukaku, as you say, Lukaku, we do need a centre forward. Absolutely, we do need a centre forward. But, but I'll be more intrigued to find out how he's going to fit with the style of play that we've had over the last you know, last two seasons, really, with the likes of Havertz in the squad now. Timo Werner, who seems as if was meant to be that main striker, but he's not, so he could be playing more out wide, which is arguably he played very well with at Leipzig in that position, so could be something for Werner to do for this season. But I'm a little bit wary of how that's going to pan out with them with them front three because you've got the quickness of Werner and Havertz. Lukaku's good, but he's not quick. Mm. He's probably a little bit deceptive, Keith. You'd probably be surprised how quick he is. Uh, but because he's big and he's quite well built, isn't he? Mm. Um, mm. But I think, listen, I think Havertz playing off him in, in a 10 role could cause people a lot of problems. A lot of problems because because we haven't got anyone occupying the centre backs at the moment, and you've got Lukaku, who I think Havertz will have a field day playing the ball in, into him and moving, and and I really do. I think I think we can look forward this season to a lot of players like Havertz is turning out to be one hell of a player, um, and he's always he's always had it in his armour. Uh, Werner. Maybe Lukaku coming in and taking the pressure off him as the number one striker might do him a little bit of good for his confidence. Um, Christensen, all of a sudden, he had an outstanding Euro. And he's like, it's like having a new player, yeah. you know, because he's getting belief. And the one thing the manager's done is he's getting players to believe. Um, and I think it bodes for an exciting season for Chelsea. Um, and I think, you know, watching the game on, I know that there was um, a Man City, you know, didn't have their full side. But it seems to me people are beginning to suss out Man City as play against them. They're beginning to, to, to and to be fair, the blueprint of that has probably been Chelsea because Leicester play set up, you know, very similar. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting. I, I think, you know, Man United, I'm not so sure about. Uh, I like Veron a lot, but I think Sancho's got a lot to prove, um, you know, within the game. And uh, the Bundesliga, apart from the top two teams, is a lot easier to play in than, than the Premier League. So it's going to be a little, I think you take a little bit of time to settle in. So I think Chelsea, I think, you know, we're on a, crest of a wave at the moment in terms of the club European champions again and I think that uh, the freshen up um, will do everyone a lot of good and and it will make people believe 
And all it needs is, is Lukaku to hit the ground running. And that might build and build and build. Um, and I think it's an exciting year. Well, I was listening to Talk Sport on the way home from a trip I did yesterday, and I'll, I may explain more of that later. But I was listening to Talk Sport, and they were talking about their predictions for top four and champions, and they put Chelsea down as favourites, which I was quite surprised with, considering how good Manchester City are with certain players. But then they were referring to the fact that City haven't got an out and out centre forward now. And it sort of got me thinking about with Lukaku, but he scored a lot of goals for West Brom, bearing in mind, see where West Brom are now. He scored a lot of goals for Everton and he did score a lot of goals for Manchester United. And this is a player who did score over a hundred goals in the Premier League. Yeah. And I I think, you know, you go into Man United and people were were giving him stick, but I, I think he's still got 20 goals or 19 goals in that season. Yeah, I know he's. I know his second season, he, he didn't really perform well and there was a lot of people that was criticising him. But then you have to look at it, was Manchester United playing to his strengths? Now, do I believe we can play to his strengths? I think we'd have to. But then, as you say, if you've got good players like Mount, for example, and Werner playing to Lukaku's strengths as well as playing to their own, we could have that striker that will score 25, 30 goals. Yes, Haaland would have been great. But as you say, there was, there was no way Dortmund was going to sell both Sancho and Haaland in the same window. Absolutely not. No. Uh, yeah, and I, I think and I, it wouldn't surprise me because that we do eventually go in for Haaland. You know, because I know, I know for a fact he's been one of our targets. They've tried everything to get him. Hmm. Um, but, you know, you've got to make a decision where it's so blatantly obvious that we need to sign a nine that's going to score 20 goals. That is the biggest problem we've got. So it's either you go for the best one available or you take a massive gamble with someone that you're not sure about who hasn't had the experience of the Premier League and it takes them a year, like Werner, even like Havertz. It's taken them nearly a, a, a year to get going because of the physicality and the circumstances, uh, you know, three games a week. Uh, that's hard for these players coming into the Premier League, um, especially at the pace it's played. Um, so you've got to go for someone that you think will guarantee you 20, 25 goals a season. And he's, t- to me, as I said, with the exception of Haaland and Kane, is the only one available that has had the experience in the Premier League to achieve that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it looks as if, as of we are recording, and this will go out um, later on this week, but it seems as if Lukaku will be signed this week. Another player that we are looking at and we are in talks with the club is Jules Kunde. He's a centre-back, French international, played in the Euros, didn't have a bad tournament, although France did get knocked out quite early. Seems as if he could be... A, another defensive addition to, where it looks as if the likes of Kurt Zuma could be on his way. What's your thoughts on buying a new centre-back considering we, we, we have had a few centre-backs in yeah. in Chelsea for the last two to three years? Yeah, well, I, listen, you can't ever criticise Zuma for effort. Uh, he really does have a go and he's very dangerous from corners. He scored a few goals for us as well. But you know something? He's a good Premier League player, but he's not a great Premier League player. And I think what he's doing, uh, uh, the manager, I think he is now looking at it and saying, right, I want the best. I want to get the the best players available. Um, And what he's doing, all the players that he doesn't think are quite good enough to help Chelsea, and the priority of all these clubs is to win the Champions League. Make, make no, you know, I hear the Premier, Premier League's a big thing, but to me, if Chelsea won the Premier League, League last year, it wouldn't have meant as much to me as that Champions League final. To me, that's the ultimate thing. To be champions of Europe is the best title I think as a football you can have. And I hear, you know, Liverpool fans saying all they wanted to win was the Premier League. Well, yeah. But we've won the Premier League in the last 30 years quite a few times. So, you know, we Champions League. So what 
Tuchel is doing, he's going for the best. And what he probably believes that he can, he's got the makings of a very good team, but he just needs two or three more jigsaw uh, pieces to make that a very, very good side. And we have to take into, sorry, I was just going to say, we have to take into the fact that Thiago Silva's one year older. Yeah. Bear it in mind, he's around 36 anyway. So he is obviously looking at the future. He's looking at yeah. Christensen, who's getting better season after season, as, as you've mentioned. Rudiger seems a different player from what he was this time last year. And yeah, bringing in Jules Kunde would be ideal. It'd be a, it'd be a fantastic addition. So we shall see how that goes. And as you say, Kurt Zuma, I've been a fan of his ever since we bought him. He's been a tremendous servant for the club and but we have already said it's good to freshen the team up and keep people on their toes a little bit Steve I want to talk about obviously the departures that we've had and there's been a lot of people who I've spoken to on social media and whatnot a little bit say concerns the wrong word but they're a little bit skeptical of where our academy's going now our academy over the last 10 years has produced some decent players who have gone on to good things. You know, they've, they've, they've earned a living out of playing football, which is ideally what professional footballer wants to do. So the academy is doing right by that. But then it's a case of we're bringing in players from the academy, the likes of James, Tammy and Luke and Mason Mount. But then which ones are the next players to come through to the, to the academy? Now, the, the departures this season, sorry, excuse me, this summer. Personally, I, I've you know when I've seen these play in the youth cup and the UEFA, you know, youth league and whatever, they are very, very talented players. So, Steve, I just want to get your thoughts on the academy setup as it is and where it's going and where these players' pathways could lead to. Because you look at, for example, Tammy Abraham, who we might sort of discuss in detail later about. He's come through the academy. He's had a season and a half of in the first team. Looks as if he's going to be out on, on the outs now because we're looking to buy someone better. So I just want to sort of go through like a small list of academy players that have just gone as recent as January. So, you, you know, Fikaro Tamore, as we know, went to AC Milan. Billy Gilmore's gone out on loan to Norwich City. Lewis Beatty has gone to Leeds United, who was a midfielder who's about 16 years old. Very, very talented player. Mark Gooley has gone to Crystal Palace. He was on loan at Swansea last season. And Valentino Livermento has gone to Southampton, who was announced last season as our young player of the year. That's just sort of a small list of players. I know there's been others that have gone. So that was just a small list of players that, for me, sort of came out for me is a little bit questionable why they've gone so soon. I mean, in fact, why the club have allowed them to go without any massive hesitation. So Steve, just want to sort of get your thoughts on these young players. And do you feel that it's the right time for their careers to leave Chelsea? Bear it in mind, as you say, we're champions of Europe, the pathway's there, but then they want to go elsewhere. Yeah, I I think, you know, with, with all these young players, they're very talented players. Chelsea have been renowned for their academy and the players they're bringing through. It's been a business within a business at Chelsea. They've made huge amounts of money loaning out these players on loan. Huge amounts of money. And it's a big income, you know, stream to the club. Um, our squad, if we do sign the players we're after, will be this, one of the strongest squads in Europe. So therefore, Gilmore... Chelsea have got no intention of letting him go. He's gone on loan to, to get more game time, to learn his trade. Uh, I think that's a good move for him. I think he needs to be playing every week in the, in the Premier League. And that's a really do, good move. Do you think that, again, I'm not sort of disparaging Norwich City because I've worked in their scouting department. I've worked for the academy. So I know it's, it's a great club. It's a, it's, it's a nice city as well to you know go and watch some football. Do you think Gilmore could have gone to, with all due respect, a better established Premier League club? Um, yeah, but I think they'd be thinking about the football that Norwich play. 
they they, they encourage a foot, very much a you know a, a, a very attractive footballing game, <coughs> which you know Billy will fit in very well there the way he plays. Um, I wouldn't want to let one of my young players go go out on loan to a rival. I wouldn't allow that at all. I would. No, uh, of course. You know, I, I so I think from all for all parties, you know, he's going to have a hard season and they're going to have to fight like mad to avoid relegation. But yeah. as a learning path, he could come out of there a much much better player. And when he's got 40, 50 Premier League games behind him, then Chelsea can invite him back into the squad and say, right, you're playing for your place now. If you do well, you're going to play because he's a very talented lad. Um, and the other boys are, 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 are extremely talented lads. I was a bit surprised the centre back went, but if we're signing, you know, another centre back, then he's got a hell of a job to try and get in that first team now. You know, mm. and I, I would think Zuma would probably be the next one to go out of the first team mm. squad. But if he doesn't go and he, and he doesn't get a move, what chance has that lad got of getting into the first team? Very remote. Tamori, I was a little bit surprised. I was, I like him. I think he's a super player. He played in a very strong league and did really well. And the reports I had that he was absolutely brilliant and they loved him. So I'm a little bit surprised about that. But again, you know, all these managers and everyone's got to remember, they've got probably six games. So what they want, I know it sounds ridiculous, but they have. If, if Thomas Tuchel from being God winning the Champions League God forbid, lost the first six games of the season, he'd be sacked. So, any manager that can look, there's only a few Klopp, I think, has earned the right to have a long term plan. You know, Bird Bielsa has earned the right to got a long term plan. But we all know Chelsea, <laughs> you're as good as your last six games. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a hard, hard thing to weigh up. Uh, having a plan over, as I said, probably three months. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you if you do look at that, that is probably a very valid point that if you say, for example, have too many youngsters in the squad whereby you've just won the European Cup, you're expected to go on now to mount a serious title challenge, albeit... Ferguson did it, but that was a completely different time to what it is now. If you put too, too many youngsters in that perhaps haven't got the experience, as, as you say, compared to what we have got, as you know, you, you've just made a good point. How are they meant to get in the squad when you've got Rudiger, Thiago Silva? You're not going to have them all, all, all of a sudden on the bench for two months while academy players are in, which is, which is fair enough. But I'm hoping that. As you say, these players do well. I'm also looking forward to seeing the young lad who's gone on loan to Palace, Connor yeah. uh, Gallagher. He's gone on loan to Crystal Palace. Good luck to him. I know Chelsea rate him as well. They rate him quite highly. So they see him as a possible prospect for the future. So it's not whereby the, the academy's drying out of products. We are sort of producing some great talent. Yeah. It's just a case of, because of the circumstances that happened with Lampard and the transfer embargo, I, I'm very interested to see which other players are going to come through that probably would have had the chance to under Frank, but obviously now things are different. But which is the next one to come through? Because James has established himself as Chelsea's first choice right back. Mount has established himself as one of the top young English players in the Premier League. Tammy, of course, he, he can score goals at a certain level. So there is there is room for optimism at Chelsea. And plus, you've also got the likes of um, Dujon Sterling, who's done yeah. quite well in pre-season as well. He's come back into the fold after suffering some bad injuries over time and been out on loan yeah. to certain clubs. So there is, there, there is room for hope for these lads at Chelsea. Yeah, I think if, if we do sell a player, a good young player. Chelsea are bright enough and do their business well enough to have a buyback clause in that contract. 
where they will make sure if they think that a lot of him is a player and someone comes in with a £20 million bid or a £15 million bid, Chelsea will get a, a, a clause in that contract where they have first option on that player. Um, so, and as I said, you know, we've, we've got two players that have come through and established themselves in the first team, um, which it doesn't sound a lot to people, but it's a huge amount. In today's game, it's a huge amount that, that those kids have come in and made those places their own. Um, you know, and I just feel that Tammy, if I'm honest, is he good enough? Is he up there with Kane? Is he up there with Haaland? Is he up there with... Because that's the players that Chelsea have got to have to maintain and stay where they are. Those are the players they've got to have. And I yeah. think Tam is one of those strikers that will score one in three, one in four chances. Um, and the only way he's going to get better is to go and play Premier League football on a regular basis. That's the mm. way... He, it's no good in keeping the bench warm uh, and playing the odd game and I'm sure that he for his sake he wants to get away hmm. can you, you know, see him and, going yeah I think he'll go yeah. I don't think there's any doubt that he will go and I think Chelsea who if you look at it have done the best business in the Premier League for the last eight years like they are their business is unbelievable um, and they sell players at the right time and there's one that springs to mind recently. That's Hazard. They sold him at the right time to maximise their... And uh, now, as great a player he is, or he was, there's a lot of clubs that will say, no, I I'm not sure. I'm not sure about him. Um, and that's down to the player. But Chelsea's handling of Hazard and the, time they sell, the, the timing of selling him and there was a lot of criticism, but my God, it was the right time. You think with Tammy going, because there were reports coming out that it, it did make me laugh that Arsenal were linked with him. I'm thinking there's no way I can't see that happening. Atalanta in Italy, very interesting move if that if that came about, playing first team football in Serie A. Aston Villa, ret possible return there. So... As you say, you look at Tammy and you look at potentially who we're bringing in and then you look at the clubs that are linked with Tammy. Is that, you know, the right move for him, that those particular clubs, they're not the ones that are going to fight for titles, but they're just underneath? Yeah, I, I, I think Tammy is not at the top level. Um, and I think a move as an example to Aston Villa who are a club on the up. Um, I think that could be a fantastic move for him. Mm. That's a big club. Aston Villa is a big club. Big fan support. Yeah. Um, Southampton, another club that's reportedly interested. <coughs> I would be very careful of that move because I think Southampton have lost a lot of good players and I think they're going to have a hard year staying in the Premier mm. League this year. I Crystal agree. Palace, other club that is, uh, that is reportedly interested in Tammy. You know, Patrick Vieira has gone in there. He's made a few signings. But again, I think they will be struggling against relegation. Uh, and I think if I was Tammy, Atalanta, yeah, they're not a bad side and they've done well recently. That's a good experience. But Aston Villa would be my number one choice in the Premier League if I was him. We shall see where this goes. I mean, the, the transfer window closes on the 31st of August. I would just want to quickly, before we do discuss uh, our expectations and our preview for the, the matches coming up, we actually, our last episode we did together, we picked out three players that we would have liked at Chelsea and three players that we would sell. So it was interesting when we did this at the time where we was thinking it either ha definitely happen or it may happen. So I just wanted to sort of go through yours first, Steve, if I can. Yours obviously was Haaland was the top one. The centre-back Anderson from Lyon, who was on loan at Fulham last season, and Yari Tillemans, who's at Leicester City. 
yeah. and the three players that you want you were thinking Chelsea would sell was Tammy Abraham, Callum Hunter the Doy, and Kurt Zuma. None of them have left yet. So you could you, you could have one prediction, right, with old Tammy. No, I, I think there's another one there. I think I think there's a couple there that I Sorry, think, with I, Zuma as well, possibly, yeah. I, I, think, I think I could have a full house there. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I think from what from what I've heard, Hudson Adoy's done well in training as well, and there's potential that he could be converted to a proper right wing back. Which, again, a little bit sceptical on. But yeah, the three players that I was thinking would go was Barkley, Jorginho. And again, I didn't know Jorginho would arguably be best player of the European Championships, and Kepa. All three are still there, but. Again, Barkley's been linked with a move away to Newcastle. Jorginho's been potentially linked with a return to Italy, but then Chelsea are linked with offering him a new contract. And Kepa, no one seems to want. So yeah. my predictions weren't that great. <laughs> well, I, I actually, I, I, I'd i forgotten that Barkley was even still at Chelsea. I, I, you know, I was like, when you said that, I thought, oh God, I would have had him. But that that's... That's how cutthroat it can be at Chelsea. They strive to be the best, and they're quite ruthless at what they do in terms of you know if you're not good enough and you don't cut the mustard or you think something isn't right, they they will you know. There's lots of players that that will be thinking to themselves, "What do I do now?" Well, uh, we've but... still got midfielders like Danny Drinkwater and Bakayoko in. Chelsea so anything can happen the fact that those two are still at the club just amazes me but we'll talk about transfers maybe next week or the week after we'll, we might even do a transfer special on a deadline day maybe but I want to talk about the upcoming season talk we've sort of discussed our sort of views on uh, Chelsea where they are at the moment but we've got two games this week the Euro, the Euro Super Cup against Villarreal Thank God they did beat Manchester United. That was a great result. And Crystal Palace, first home game of the season on Saturday, 14th of August at Stamford Bridge. The UEFA Super Cup, Steve, some people call it a friendly. Some people do take it seriously. Me, for my for one, excuse me, I do take it seriously because, again, it's a trophy. You're pitting yourself against a top European side. And again... We haven't won the competition for a while. The last time we won it, we beat Real Madrid. So, you know, quite a, quite a long time ago with uh, Gus Poyet scoring the winner. We haven't won it since. So, it's a competition that's overdue in the Chelsea cabinet. Yeah, I, I think it, I, I'm like you. I think that's quite a, an honour to win. I think it's, a, you know, it's, it's another trophy. It's another symbol that we're the best team in Europe. You know, um, and uh, if I was a player... I wouldn't take that as a friendly. I'd be looking at that as as, as an opportunity to to win a trophy. Um, and I think it's you know it's a lot more competitive than the the charity shield or the community cup as they call it now or the community shield. It's more a lot more competitive. And those mm. Spanish players will go out on that pitch wanting to win as well. Um, you know they they're, they're going to want it. Mm. Um, you know so I think it, I think it's an exciting game to. Uh, to watch and, and to look at, I think great, and I think Chelsea will win. I think Chelsea will win well. Well, the last the last three finals we've been in that competition. We've lost. We lost to Atletico Madrid under Di Matteo. We then lost to Bayern on penalties under Jose Mourinho, and then we lost to Liverpool a, a couple of years ago on on penalties. But as you say, big game. I think Tuchel will take it seriously because, as you say, it is a trophy, and Tuchel is wants to get that momentum going and he wants to sort of implement a few things with the squad. I don't imagine Lukaku will be at Chelsea at that point. I don't don't think he'll be anywhere near the squad by the time he eventually signs. So he could maybe play Havertz up top with Werner and Mount on either side, potentially with Kovacic, Jorginho and Kante in midfield. You never know. The way he sort of has played it, Rudiger's been involved. Thiago Silva would be interesting if he actually plays, bearing in mind Palace on the 14th. 
And I think he, I think he will play. A, I think he will play a strong squad on Wednesday. Yeah. I do. I, I think he'll play oh. top team. I, mm. I really do. I think. You know. I think when you're, as I said, when you're manager of Chelsea, you need to win every cup you possibly can. Mm. Because if you don't, it, 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 it it's like almost like a black mark. You, you know, you, you've got that. So he will want to win this. And he will want to start the season with a trophy. And then, mm. of course, he wants to end the season with a couple of trophies as well. But, but that's, you know, that, that I think that's a big game. And I think we should take that very seriously. And plus, if, you know, looking at it from a fan's point of view, if we do win it on Wednesday, they can parade it in front of the, the crowd on Saturday, which I will be Absolutely. there. So that'll be, that'll be quite nice. Absolutely. That, that will be, <laughs> absolutely, you know, and they want to do it. The players will want that. And, Chelsea are hungry now. They 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 they've had their success, uh, and they want to keep it going. And uh, I think we'll win. Well, Steve, the other thing I wanted to sort of ask you as well. I wanted to get your prediction on the Villarreal game because this season, the Blue Day podcast has created a Chelsea predictor league that involves ex Chelsea players and supporters. The deadline to apply to join the league is now shut. So you can't enter until next season. But thank you for everyone who has emailed me on the Blue Day podcast at gmail.com with your details. I will be in touch later today or this week, in fact, to get your predictions for the upcoming game. So, Steve, just to kick it off, what's your score prediction for the UEFA Super Cup on Wednesday night? I think Chelsea will win 2 0. Right, I've written that down in my little black book because for those of you that maybe are not aware, Blue Day Podcast created this league with ex-Chelsea players and I will happily announce who, who is involved as well, Steve. So we've got the, Steve Wicks, as of course. Clive Wilson's involved. Mark Nichols is involved. John Dempsey, the great John Dempsey as well, is involved as well. So we've got a few Chelsea lads as part of this league. And the supporters that are part of it, thank you again for joining. Whoever whoever does finish top will get a prize. If an ex-Chelsea player wins it, they will get a prize as well. That will be uh, confirmed later on. So it's a good good thing to do and hopefully good luck to everyone involved. So that's the Villarreal game, the Crystal Palace game, which is on Saturday at three o'clock. Funny enough, the last time Chelsea were at home, Premier League, Three o'clock kickoff. We was at home to Burnley under Antonio Conte, and we lost three two. I was there at that game. I, I took my then girlfriend, who's now my wife. wasn't a very happy day um, after the game, losing to Burnley. Gary Cahill got sent off after ten minutes or something, if I if I can recall. I can't imagine for one minute a repeat will happen. But Palace have turned up at Stamford Bridge now and again from time to time against us. So a little bit sceptical, a little bit wary of what's going to happen. Of course, with Patrick Vieira's first game, we don't know what to expect. So I'm personally expecting a very tight game. Steve, I don't know whether you agree or do do you think the shackles will be off? Chelsea will play the free-flowing brand of football. I'm not again. I'm not expecting Lukaku to start if he if he does sign by that point, but he could be involved. And again, it'll be interesting how Palace set up. It'd be very interesting. You know, the the one thing about uh, Roy Hodgson is that his teams were very organised, mm. and away from home they were very defensive and they played on the counter attack. It'd be interesting to see how Patrick uh, sets up his team, mm. um, and you know, it might play into Chelsea's hands that they'd be a little bit more adventurous because um, they do tend or did tend to sit back in two banks of well and played one up front and you know and really did defend and then you know that they caused us problems on the break but it'd be interesting because they've got a lot of new players mm. Anderson being one of them my yes yeah the player that you predicted yeah uh, yeah um, you know so it, but again, we're playing at home. Hopefully, we will have that super cup in the draw in the cabinet, um, and teams will fear us. It, it, and it's about us stamping our authority in the game. 
and not allowing a team like Palace to get back in the game. But the first game of the season, trust me, is the oddest game you'll play. It, it, it's really quite... Because there's no form, is there, really? You can't That's go right. back. Form. It's all about the day. And uh, there's been a lot of funny results on the first day of the season. Mm. What's your experiences of playing first game of the season at any club, whether it's Chelsea or Derby? You know, what's your sort of experiences, especially in the in the dressing room against a team that you're not too sure about? You know, whether they've had a new manager or new signings. Have you got any sort of weird experiences that you could share with us? Well, I, I think it's it. You know, one of the worst pre seasons that we ever had at QPR. Uh, we played Hendon, I think it was. Our last warm-up game was Hendon. And we were one nil down with 15 minutes to go. And we thought to ourselves, dearie me, we got Notts Forest on Saturday. You know, European, well, not European Champions, but a very good side with Roy Keane and all those boys, Piercy and everyone. And we had, uh, we had them on the Saturday. Anyway, we scored two goals in the last five minutes and we played dreadfully. It was Alan Mullery who had just taken over from Terry Venables. And then six games into the season, we were top of the league. We were top of the league. And um, it was the weirdest thing because all of a sudden we turned up against Notts Forest on the Saturday and beat, hammered them 3-0. Yeah. And that's how, how funny it can be. But um, no, they, they are strange games. They, you, 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 there's anticipation, there's excitement. Um, all around the ground. And there's probably a little bit more excitement than the, than the normal game. So there's a real sort of, it, it, it's great. And you've also won your battle to get into the team because all the whole of pre-season is proving that, you know, you want to play in the first team and these first teams picked and you're there. So you feel good about that. Um, yeah, but it's going to be, uh, you know, the first game of the season. I remember when we went up back into the first division um, a very young side and we played West Brom and for honestly for an hour we were far the better side mm. and we ended up losing 3-0 but for an hour we should have we should have been two goals up and we just played them off the pitch but they scored three goals in the last I think it was 25 minutes 20 minutes mm. you know so uh, it's a funny old day but uh, I'm sure Chelsea will come out on top I'm sure I'm sure they will I think it just goes to show that doesn't matter about whether you have a bad pre-season doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a bad league season certainly not so that that will be interesting what sort of transpires between now and the end of the season for certain clubs but one thing I did want to mention uh, actually before I do as you, I did get your prediction for the UEFA Super Cup. Just quickly, you bear in mind we haven't signed Lukaku yet. If he does have any involvement, but what's your prediction for the Crystal Palace game? I'd go two 0 again. Two-nil. I'm very confident in our defence. You know, we haven't conceded hardly any goals, mm. and I think that's a great thing. You always build build from the back, mm. um, and we have been very very tight at the back. And I think that you know if Lukaku doesn't play. We we have had a problem in getting that first goal in some league games, and that's so important. If we can get the first goal and settle down, um, and indeed we don't allow them to score the first goal, where you're playing catch up and you you, you get a little bit you know desperate. But I, I fancy us to win two 0 Interesting, interesting. So that's that. Steve Wicks is prediction. I will be putting up the league tables on our Instagram and Facebook page, but it will be fantastic to have fans back. And I know fans have been involved in friendly matches. We played Arsenal the the other last weekend, and then we played Tottenham during the week. I didn't go to that game against Tottenham. I was busy, but it was nice to see crowds back at, uh, back at football matches. And as you say, fans, you know, not being involved in football matches over the past year and a bit, it's been tough. It's and it's nice to watch football now where there's fans involved. Yeah, I think it's made a huge difference, isn't it? Just the the whole, you know, I was watching the uh, 
EFL on the on the TV, and it was so great to hear an atmosphere and see the fans. Um, and it, you know, it, I think it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic to have them back. Well, it's funny you should mention that because this weekend I went up to a Coventry to see Coventry versus Nottingham Forest. I had nothing else to do on a Sunday, so I thought I'd travel up there and watch watch a game of football. Three hour drive from where I live, so that was a bit of that was a bit interesting. But it was it was great to see fans back in stadium for a competitive game, albeit you know where you go and watch friendly games. But to see Coventry score that last minute winner, and then you see fans, and bear it in mind, Coventry have had a bit of a tough time. Over the last couple of years, you know, they've ground shared with Northampton, they've ground shared with Birmingham. But to see the fans see, celebrate a 95th minute winner, you know, fans were crying, fans were hugging each other. And, you know, be it we've lived in, you know, we're living in a COVID pandemic, but to see fans back in stadiums, football's not the same without supporters. And in their true home seats as well. Yes. That, that, must, have been, that, that must have been a real. You know that last that that winning goal in the last minute would have just been the cream on the uh, you know on the cake for, for for all Coventry fans. They're back home. They started off with a win. Life doesn't get any better than that, does it? Mm. But the, the the thing that sort of struck me and it sort of got me a little bit emotional was the fact that I sat in my seat and the guy came up to me. And he sort of said he asked me if I've taken over the seat as a season ticket. I said no, no, no. It was just. For one match and he explained to me that the seat that I took was it was a supporter who sadly passed away due to COVID and he was a Coventry City season ticket holder for over 40 years and it was his seat since the, they moved into the Rico Arena that was it that was his seat since then but and he didn't realize I was a Chelsea fan but he said that the chap who died his family all supported Chelsea oh how ironic was that? And also, uh, also extremely sad when you you hear of stories like that about. Mm. You know, that there are some weird people about that, that say that COVID doesn't exist, and you know how many people have you had that that you know have died of, of COVID? Well, you know that story is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Mm. Well, it got me as well because Coventry did a, a montage video of all the supporters who passed away throughout lockdown and since Coventry played their last competitive game in front of supporters and the person who I took the seat from um, unfortunately he came up on the screen and people next to me were crying and yeah. but it was, it was it was quite emotional I know Chelsea I believe against Crystal Palace they're going to do something quite similar whereby they're going to have like a bit, a bit of a montage video with you know, the names of supporters who are no longer with us because of COVID. And I, I, I think it's a very nice touch that clubs are doing that to give something back to the supporters. I think it means a lot for those that perhaps knew them, but also the ones that, you know, you sit next to for the past 20 years. You And he, he is part of your family because you see him every other week, Saturdays at three o'clock. Yeah, no, I, I, I think hmm. it's... Uh... I think when you see something like that, it, it does hit home. Mm. It really does. You know, I think that, um, um, you know, my son plays rugby. and I used to go and watch him every game, home and away. Um, and a great dad of one of the players who, um, who went every single week, no matter where it was, because they played quite, you know, national one. Um, went every weekend. Absolutely great lad died of COVID, 48 years of age, and it, and it, it hits home how, you know, how lucky we are not to have been infected or, or not one of our families, touch wood, have died of this thing. Mm. We're very lucky and we've got to always remember that and to give tributes to those Chelsea fans and Coventry fans, I think that's fantastic by the football club and uh, very important to keep that togetherness and respect. Absolutely. No, I, I completely agree. And I'll, I'm, I'll be looking forward to going to the game on Saturday and then again, again seeing 
people who I haven't seen for a while and it, 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 it will be nice. I'm looking forward to it. A few things before we do finish. I'm going to announce the next ex-player guest to come onto the show. Of course, thank you for everyone who's sort of liked and subscribed to our YouTube channel because of the amount, because of the guests that we've had over the summer. And Steve, you know, the, the summer's been quite hectic for me. Although football clubs have not done too much, it has been absolute hectic for me. I've, I've, if I'm not gone grey, I'll be going bald for contacting players for at, you know, ex-players all four corners all four corners of the globe you know from america to uruguay to australia to all the way down to the blasted timbuktu it's been it's been stressful for me personally I will, I will gladly admit it but it's been nice to get stories from players who have worn the famous chelsea shirt and ones that have spoken about great people the likes of you know when i've spoken to spoken about for example Dennis Wise, we've spoke, you know, I've spoken to Chris Hutchins, for example. He, he was one of our guests that we've had over the summer and we was talking about Chelsea in the 80s. People like Kevin Hitchcock, you know, fantastic goalkeeper in his time, who's a great servant for Chelsea. But we've also got somebody coming up this week. We've got two episodes this week on the podcast, as we didn't have one last week. And this man signed in the summer of 1987. He was represented England in the European Championships in 88. He was also there at Italia 90. Left Chelsea in very controversial circumstances, which we will talk about. And that is Tony Dorigo, former Chelsea left-back, then went on to Leeds United and Derby. He'll be joining us at the Blue Day podcast this week to discuss his Chelsea career. Steve, I think you actually played with Tony for one season, wasn't it? It was that uh, yeah. season of 87, 88. Do you have any sort of memories of playing yeah, with Tony? To... What was he like as a footballer? Oh, he was a great footballer. Had a beautiful left foot. Could ping the ball. Fantastic. Very quick. Very, very good player. Um, but I used to travel into work with him, with Stevie Clark. We used to live in the uh, Cambly area. And we always used to travel into work together. Uh, and Tony's a great lad. And his wife Heather is lovely, a lovely person. And um, it was great, great times. And Tony um, went on to be uh, obviously very successful in his international career, um, and he deserved it. He was, in fact, I think I'm right saying Stuart Pearce. If Stuart Pearce hadn't existed, he'd probably got a lot more. Um, he would have got a lot more caps, yeah. Um, but um, he was a Lovely lad and a great football, great football. So he'll be on the podcast this week. We are looking to scale down a few of the player interviews because of the the football season's back. So I will be busy during the week and on weekends, but we will be having player interviews at least once a month. So don't worry if you're sort of missing your fix. But if you if you are looking to listen to one of our interviews. They are up on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, the Blue Day Podcast. We've had some unbelievable guests since we started back in September. It's nearly been a year since the podcast has begun. We've had some unbelievable guests and I'm thankful for every single one of them to be part of the podcast. So find us on um, YouTube of the Blue Day Podcast. Follow us on Instagram. We will be doing more videos and pictures of a especially on Saturday where I'll be going, I'll be at the Matthew Hardin lower. If anybody is listening to this, who is going to the game, wants to have a beer with me, I'll be at the Lots Road pub on Saturday before the game. And even after the game, find us on Facebook at the Blue Day podcast, where you'll see videos, past videos of highlights of our games and certain interviews as well. And also follow us on Twitter at the Blue Day podcast, where we'll hopefully upload some more content on there. But Steve, great to be, have you back on the show and it was great to hopefully talk about Chelsea winning against Villarreal and Crystal Palace next week, hopefully, with our next episode. Yeah, lovely. Hope so, Keith. Superb. So, Steve, thank you very much for your time today. I have been Keith Florence. Stay safe, fellow Chelsea supporters, and carefree.
This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.